All right, one o'clock, and we're going to be looking in on an introduction to Launchpad. So thank you, Taryn, for the presentation. Uh, this is track two, and we'd like to thank our sponsors. So thank you to the Evergreen Community Development Initiative for the platform sponsorship. Mobius is also sponsoring the captioning, which is available for the session. I just put the link in the chat and we'll put it there a bit later on during the presentation. If you have any questions for Taryn, you can put it in the chat or the Q&A section, either or works. And this is also recorded, so it'll be uploaded to the community YouTube in a couple weeks post-conference. Taryn, are you all set? I am. Thank you, Okay, Tina. no problem. Um, first of all, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Taryn McKenna. I'm the Pines Program Manager at Georgia Public Library Service, and I'm also one of the Evergreen Community Bug Wranglers. Um, and uh, just to let you know, um, you know, I can do a little bit of code, but I'm not an actual like developer with a capital D. Um, but I do um, want to let you all know, first off, that you don't have to be a developer uh, to be able to contribute your expertise. Um, so that today's session is mainly aimed at people who are either new to Evergreen or those of you who have been using Evergreen for a while but who would like to learn more about what bugs have already been reported, what wish list requests are out there, what things are being worked on, um, and also to take the next step and not just learning about that, but also contributing um, feedback in the terms of helping to prioritize which issues get worked on, uh, which things get funded by development um, partners, which, um, you know, and also to uh, work on testing things. Uh, there are always um, bugs, bug patches being developed by different entities that are being submitted and those all need to be tested in order to make sure that they will solve the actual problem for everyone and not cause any other problems and the more testers the better <clears throat> so um in you know with all of that i'm sure you've figured out by now that evergreen is open source uh, meaning that there's no licensing fee and that the code is freely available to look at to download to customize but it also means that there's not a massive corporation somewhere that owns the software um, and that is responsible for doing bug fixes and improvements and developing new features that means that the overall health and growth of the evergreen software is utterly reliant upon people in our community the evergreen community of uh, being actively involved um, so with any open source software, it's not good enough to just assume that somebody else is going to solve a problem. We have to be responsible for making changes happen in whatever way we can. Um, you know, the other hand of that is that we also, that also gives us the opportunity to have more influence over how we want the software to work and what features we want added than a commercial vendor software who honestly just wants to make money and doesn't really care <laughs> what the end users uh, think as long as they're still buying their product. Um, so our involvement as a community, it might mean contributing funding to development projects, um, either through uh, an individual entity uh, paying a developer or um, a, an individual that works for an institution doing development and contributing it back to the community. Um, or it could be through a joint effort, such as the Evergreen Community Development Initiative. Um, Pines, who I work for, is one of the ECDI partners. Um, and we have been able to contribute funding to that in order to uh, contribute to much, much larger development projects than we would have been able to pay for on our own. Um, and, you know, even if you're at an institution that isn't able to contribute actual development or funding for development, you can also contribute in other ways, such as writing documentation um, or even just reporting bugs and testing proposed fixes. Uh, and that's what we'll focus more on here today. Uh, 
and the reason that we like to try to encourage more people to participate is that even though Evergreen is being used all around the world in multiple countries and in multiple languages, and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of frontline staff that are relying on the software every day to do their jobs, the number of people that actively and consistently participate directly in development testing is less than 100 people. Um, and that's a lot of work. Um, you know, it, it, you know, if I didn't have my normal duties, I could easily spend all day working on this. Uh, and I would love to, <laughs> but, but I have my own normal duties uh, as well, um, which takes away from my bug wrangling. But, um, but the more people that we can get involved, the better. Uh, there are technical barriers to some people, but I'll get more into Bug Squashing Week and how we can get, um, work around some of those barriers for testing a little bit later. So as I said in the beginning, um, I want to emphasize again and again that you do not have to be a software developer or a system or database administrator co to contribute your expertise. Those are critical skills. I mean, we wouldn't be here without the members of the community that have those skills, but we, it is also essential that we involve people who actually use the software on a daily basis or who are supporting the staff that use the software on a daily basis um, and have to work, you know, work through workarounds and troubleshoot issues. You know, if you do that in your role, um, or if you're a specialist in something like circulation or acquisitions or cataloging, then your knowledge and the way you use the software and your local workflows are invaluable for testing and feedback. It's really weird to do a presentation where I can't see people's faces. <laughs> um, so this is where uh, I'm going to start talking about Launchpad. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Can everybody see that all right? Oh, yes, and thanks, Gina. Um, the uh, I have a set of notes here um, that Gina just put the link to in chat um, and so that you don't have to take notes as I go through. Uh, this should have all of the key points that I talk about in here and a few examples of things. Okay, so back to Launchpad. So the link to Launchpad is right at the top of those notes. And this is the main Launchpad page. Launchpad is the system that the Evergreen community uses to track all of the uh, bugs and wish list requests and um, uh, progress that's being made on bugs and discussions about how something should actually work that one person might think is a bug and another person thinks is a feature um, and patches that are ready to test. Basically everything to do with the development is, is goes through Launchpad at some point. Um, even if it's a brand new feature that's being developed, that gets put into a Launchpad bug uh, with the code linked so that it can be tested. So the first thing that, sorry, there's a little pop up in front of my screen. There we go. There's the first thing that you need to do when you go to Launchpad is register for an account if you haven't done so already. And um, if you, it brings you to this Ubuntu one, don't let that throw you off. That's just the, um, the, uh, you know, the server software that's running it. Um, and you can, just create an account with your email and name and password. That's all you need. Um, I already have an account, so I'm just going to go ahead and log in. Okay. So um, the main overview page on Launchpad, um, I don't really use um, very often. Um, but it does have a few pieces of useful information. Um, there are some links to the main Evergreen um, site, like the main site for the software, the Evergreen Wiki, which includes a lot of 
um, specific information about um, the history of Evergreen and documentation and working groups and all sorts of things. Um, so that's like kind of a catch all for everything that's not on the home page. Um, and the downloads page. If you look at the downloads page, that shows the currently supported versions. Um, 3.7 is the most recently released version, and that's on 3.7.0. Uh, 3.6 and 3.5 are still supported. Um, and 3.6 has the most recent point release is 3.6.3. And 3.5, the most recent is 3.5.4. And the release notes is the main reason to come to this page. Because if you're running, let's say, you know, 3363 three, and you want to know what has been released since then if you take a look at the 37 release notes um, you can see all of the new features and um, an overview of the bug fixes that were included in that if you look at one of the older release notes you'll see that it has everything like this 36 um, everything for the 36 release um, which had the major features is at the bottom. And then as each point release comes out, which is usually bug fixes, um, then the then that's added to this document. So if you're on 361, you can take a look and see what was added in 362 and 363. So back to this page, that in basic information about what releases are out and supported is also available here. You can drag and drop this little thing to see, see more info. Um, so what this is showing is uh, everything in black, that's a released version. So you can see that, and then everything in white is the next version that's on the slate. So the major releases, 3.5, 3.6, those contain all of the major new features that are added. So for example, um, uh, you know, 3.6 included the new curbside pickup feature. Um, 3.7, now I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> we just released 3.7 and I was on the release team, so I should know off the top of my head uh, what major features were added into it. Um, um, oh, well, one thing that is added into 3.7 is um, some new geolocation uh, features. Um, so geolocation information is being added to that. Uh, you know, and I can just go and look at the downloads page and see more about what's in 3.7 R rather than trying to remember off the top of my head. Um, so, you know, you can see um, the new features that were added here. And so, anyway, you get the idea. So, as each major release comes out, those include the new big features. And then as bug fixers are done, uh, they get added into point releases. So, and then everything gets added to master. So master's like the main core code. As each bug fix is accepted into Evergreen, it gets added to master. And then at certain points, that is packaged into a release. So if a new bug fix gets added, to master at the next point it gets updated it will automatically go into 3.8 when it gets packaged and it will also get backported into the previous point releases so 371 364 355 assuming that it can be sometimes there's new code related to a bug that can't be backported all of the way back because it relies on some other piece of code um, but it will get backported as far as it can be um, so it will be included in each of those. So um, hopefully I didn't confuse everyone with that. Does anybody have any questions about the releases before I move on? Okay. If you do, just put them in chat and I'll, I will get back to them. Okay, so the main uh, play thing that we're going to look at on uh, Launchpad is the bugs tab. You will spend most of your time here. So this bugs tab have, um, oh, Jeremy said uh, some might not know what point releases are for. So a point release is basically just a set of bug fixes. So if you're running 362, 
there may be some new bug fixes that come out. And if you apply, if you upgrade to 363, it will include all of those bug fixes. Um, so the bugs tab here, this shows by default all of the open bugs and wish list requests. And there is a whopping 2,515 of them. Um, and I'll, let me just look at, I'm going to sort by number so I can see a recent one that's easy. Um, so this is one that was just submitted um, this morning. And I chose this one because it's it's simple. Um, so this one uh, it has a title, load shared bucket text error. Uh, the description, um, the title of the box where you open a shared bucket says load shared bucket bucket by ID. So this is just a simple typo, which is a completely valid bug. Um, uh, you know, some of the bug requests are much more complicated than this. Um, so. Elizabeth uh, submitted this bug this morning, um, two hours ago. She tagged it with a buckets tag, and I'll talk about tags more in a moment. Um, and she included a screenshot, which is nice. And you can see the error there. Um, another thing that would be good to add uh, would be the version number that she's on that she took the screenshot of. Um, and but um, you know it's not absolutely critical in all cases, but it is very helpful, especially if the bug sits around for a while. Um, and then Elaine Hardy came in after that, reviewed the bug and confirmed it. Now um, I'll go through some of the other things we can do here uh, in a little bit, but I just wanna show you the basic anatomy of a bug. Oh, and another thing here is that the, um, heat level. You'll hear a lot of us say, please go add heat to this bug. So this is a number that's generated based on how many people um, say that the bug affects them. And the higher the heat number, the more people it affects. And um, that helps the developers and the funding agencies uh, determine what to prioritize. Um, so if you are logged in, uh, you will see this, this bug affects X number of people. Does this bug affect you? You can click the little sign or the little uh, pen and say, yes, it affects me. And now it says this bug affects you and three other people and it increases the heat number. And I don't know exactly how the numbers work. I just know that the numbers um, go up the more people uh, say it affects them. You know, as a... Um, let me try. Thanks, Blake. Oh, there it goes. It went up after I refreshed the page. Um, so that actually added four heat points when I said it affected me. Now, um, you can also edit some of these other things. Like if Elizabeth had not put in the buckets tag um, and you were, you were reviewing it, you could click there and add a, another tag. And um, I'll get back to tags in a second, because we do have an authorized tag list. Um, actually, I'll go ahead and talk about that right now. So on your handout, the second link is a link to Launchpad tags. Oh, thanks, Judith. I never noticed that. She said if you click on the flame, oh, it actually tells about it. Affected users add four points per user. Um, and um, so the official tags are here. Uh, when you are typing in a tag, it will actually give you a drop down of authorized tags that you can choose from. Um, you can type in any tag, but we discourage that just for tidiness purposes. Um, so when, you know, when possible, use the existing tags just because that just helps keep things organized. Um, most of you are librarians, so <laughs> I'm sure you're familiar with using using authorized forms of things um, to help keep things um, tidy. Um, so uh, if you select from that list, then you know you're selecting something that's authorized. Some of them are not particularly clear uh, about what they mean. 
Um, so there's definitions here. One of the ones I'd like to point out that's not very clear is the um, needs test. And that has a little asterisk because it is um, a specialized tag. And so needs test kind of um, implies that it would just needs to be tested, but that's not what it's actually for. It actually is saying that it needs an automated programmatic test to be written. So that's a developer specific thing. Um, oh, thanks, Jason. Jason says if only certain users can actually type in anything and it rejects it if you're not on the bug wrangler team. Uh, I've been on the bug wrangler team for quite a while, so I, I, I did not realize that. Um, but yes, um, only bug wranglers are authorized to add to the official list of tags. Um, I'm a bug wrangler. Um, you're welcome to contact me if you want an, a tag added. Um, and in fact, I added one this just right before this for um, curbside. And did I not? Oh, here it is. I had to refresh the page. Um, because we have, uh, you know, a number of tickets related to curbside pickup now, so which is a new feature or a relatively new feature as of last year, um, and so I added a new official tag for that because it didn't, um, you know, it fit its own category on top of circulation. And yes, there are diminishing returns with adding too many tags. Absolutely. So. Um, one of the reasons why tags are so important, if I go back to the main bugs page, the built-in uh, search is not so great. Um, it's one of, I like Launchpad for a lot of things, but the search is not one of them. Um, the search only searches tickets that are considered open. So it's not gonna, it's only gonna search amongst these uh, 2,500 tickets, not any of the ones that are already closed. Um, so nothing that's been fixed and released in a version. Um, and if you can go into advanced search for that, which I'll show you in a second. Um, uh, and it will only search the titles and initial descriptions. It doesn't search the uh, comments and all of the additional information that gets added. So, you know, it's it's not bad to, to start out with your search there and you can search by number. So if you have, um, if somebody tells you to go look at ticket number um, such and such, you can search for that number and it will work. <laughs> and um, reading the comments in the peanut gallery over there. Um, and uh, so, it, so with tags, if you look over to the right, you'll see a list of tags here. And that is organized by uh, which tickets have the most open, open um, bugs and wish lists and it doesn't differentiate between bugs and wish list requests um, so you can see cataloging has the most um, the reason for that isn't necessarily that cataloging has the most bugs um, it, it or, or wish list requests but the cataloging group is extremely active and participates a lot so they're very good at adding their bugs and comments here <laughs> Elizabeth, the yes, catalogers are the coolest. <laughs> um, so, um, and so some of the some of this is dependent upon you know how active the people that are using that particular functionality are, um, and some of it is also that the new in the three point um, three point six the new staff catalog was rolled out. So there are a lot of tickets that were generated because of that. So um, cataloging wasn't quite as high before that rolled out. So you can click on any one of those and, um, and see what the tickets are. Um, and it will by default sort them by priority level. Um, a lot of them won't necessarily have a priority level if you go through. If I sort opposite, for example, um, I'll see undecided. Um, those just haven't been assigned a priority level yet, and that's another bug wrangler activity. Um, many of them are still marked new. That means nobody has gone in and confirmed them. Um, so let's take a look at one, for example, here. 
So this one is, um, she said it's a wish list item. Uh, this is, was just um, put in this week. It affects several different people. I'm going to go ahead and say, yes, this does affect me. Now, this is still marked new. Now, normally I would say, yes, I agree with this. I'm going to confirm this, but Elaine is actually with my organization at Pines. And it's good practice not to confirm something that somebody at your own organization submitted. It's better to have someone at a different organization confirm it um, because that puts a different perspective on it. Um, someone might say that this is a you know something is a bug where someone else might disagree and they want it to work the way it is already working um so you know at least two different organizations should look at it before it gets confirmed so i'm not going to submit that um i as a bug wrangler i'm going to go ahead and mark that as a medium um, most things get marked as a medium fix when convenient or scheduled to fix later um, something that's low might be something like a typo that only shows up, you know, to a, you know, inside the um, code or something like that, or inside a log where hardly anybody is ever going to see it except for a system administrator. Um, and then high and critical, those are reserved for things that are actually on fire. Now, if I was going to work on fixing this, um, if I knew how, <laughs> then I would assign that to myself. Um, and that way, that would allow other people other to know that I was working on it. Uh, you can also assign things to yourself if you are testing a bug. So for example, during bug squashing week, if there was a patch for this and it got loaded onto a server for testing, you could assign it to yourself to let people know that you were working on testing it. And then you would unassign it afterwards so and you would just click and say it signed me and then click again to remove yourself the milestones here those let me go back and find one that has a milestone um, so right now my screen isn't showing me milestones you can click i have this set just to show a few things you can click on the little gear icon here to show what properties of the bugs you want to see. So I'm just going to go ahead and turn them all on for the sake of demonstration. And then when you're doing it yourself, you can decide what you actually want to see. So this is all of the fields turned on, which makes the page a little harder to read. Um, but it also lets you sort by any of those things as well. So milestones, if I sort by milestone, I can say, okay, here's one for 364. So this one has milestones set. And these get set by the bug wranglers when there is an actual patch submitted. Um, and typically when it actually is ready to go um, and is either in, in testing or has been ideally when it's been signed off. Um, so this one is a little more complicated than that last one we looked at. The initial bug report, um, and this is going to be Greek to, to most of you, I'm sure, um, but this bug report um, has more information about which version. Um, he included the not just the Evergreen version, but also the database version and the open source version. Um, and he included several different um, tags here. And then the pull request tag is a special one because that gets added by someone who submits an actual patch that's ready for testing. And I'll go through the overall workflow more in a little bit. Um, but I just wanted to point out when, when someone does submit a patch, they upload it to Git, uh, which I don't expect you to understand right away if you're new. Um, and uh, they will include the link and then they'll add a pull request. So if you see something that says pull request, then you'll know that there's a patch that's ready for testing. If you see a tag that says signed off, that means that um, there's a patch and someone has already tested it and signed off on it. And so when he um, submitted that patch, he set the milestone and that allows the release team to see which patches are uh, ready to be tested and targeted into 
a particular bug release or major release. I hope that makes sense. So um, this one, uh, you know, this was originally reported um, back when 3.3 was still uh, being supported actively, which it is no longer being actively supported. So that's why it says won't fix on 3.3 and 3.4 because only 3.5 and above are being actively supported at this point. So let's go back to the previous page. So I'm going to go back just to the main bugs page. Um, let's see if there's anything else you can. Uh, I, I love the fact that you can turn on tags to be shown um, on this screen. Um, some of the information I don't look at as much, so I would turn those off. So I'm going to turn off um, a few of these that I don't look at as much. Okay, that makes it a little bit easier to read. Um, <clears throat> so you can sort, like I said, you can sort by any of the uh, properties that you're displaying. Um, if you want to see the newest, you can either, um, like the newest reported one, you can sort by number. Um, so there is one that was just, that is just two hours old. That's the one we just looked at. You can also reverse sort and see one that was 11 years old that's still in there. Um, you can also sort by date last updated if you want to, you know, keep track of what new activity is going on. So you can also do advanced search. Um, as I said before, the built-in search is not very good. Uh, so if you do the advanced search, you get a lot more um, flexibility in your search. Um, for one thing, you can search for things that are fixed released. So if I'm, if I'm positive that I saw a bug in here before <laughs> and I cannot find it, it's possible that the bug was fixed and released in a version that I just haven't upgraded to yet. So you can turn that on. Um, you can undo all those if you just want to search fixed released. Uh, you can also do things like um, search by reporter or subscriber. Like if I know if I'm if I think I reported a bug, but I can't remember what I called it and I can't find it, I can uh, just click the little um, uh, magnifying glass and say pick me, and it will let me search by things that I've submitted. And so this is all, uh, you know, the the open the open things that I submitted. If I want to see things that um, I commented on, I could do the same thing. Like if I if I remember talking, having a discussion in a bug comment about something, I can search uh, my name the same way there. Um, and if I want to narrow that down, I can use either search terms or tags. And so if I want to see just the bugs that I commented upon that had to do with the OPAC, which I'm sure there's a few, um, then I can search that way. So that narrows it down a little bit. There's still 134 results uh, because uh, there is a lot of OPAC um, issues out there and I've commented upon at least half of them. So um, you can also do things like search. Um, you can use the, the minus to eliminate things from your search. So if I want to say things, for example, that have a pull request, whoops, caps lock, that have the pull request tag, but that have not been signed off on yet, then I can do pull request space minus signed off and search that way. And I did it wrong. Um, so I need to do all. So if you want to do same thing, something like search for circulation, but not, but eliminate all of the billing ones, you could do that, for example. Um, 
you can also, if you're still struggling to find things, you can also go rely on Google. Um, if you do, a lot of you probably already know this, but if you do um, a site colon with a domain, then Google will search that site for you. And one of the advantages of this um, is not, not only that it searches pretty much everything, including all of the comments, um, but it will also search both the open and closed bugs, so you don't have to go through and check all of the different statuses to do a advanced search. So if I did, um, you know, and then you can also use Google's um, quotation marks if you want to search for a phrase and that sort of thing. And so I could do that and um, sometimes find what I'm looking for this way. I do this as a last resort just because it's an extra step, but it is very handy if you're having trouble finding something that you're positive is there. So another thing you can do, um, if you find something that you're really interested in, um, let's find, I'll just pick one at random here. If I want to follow this bug and, you know, follow, get notified every time someone makes a comment on it, you can, um, oh, I'm subscribed to something as, I'm already subscribed to everything, I think, so uh, I'm not seeing the right option, but if you're not subscribed to everything, then you would see an option here to allow you to subscribe. Um, to that bug and oh, I guess I can't even I could say receive all emails about this bug and then every time that bug gets updated in any way you'll get an email if you want to do something like subscribe to all of the cataloging bug comments um, that come through if you're on the main bugs page you can do subscribe to bug mail here and you can set up a subscription and you know i since i'm a bug regular i i subscribe to everything i get notified every single time anything gets updated um but most people aren't going to want to do that um so if i wanted to subscribe to like all the cataloging bugs i could just type in whatever subscription name i want and I can choose whether I just want to get emailed when a new bug is opened or closed or if I want to get emailed every time um, a comment gets added. And then I would add a filter and then I'm going to do tags, which is usually the most reliable. Um, and I would put in the cataloging tag. And that's another reason why we want to use the, you know, stick to the authorized tag list to make it easier. Uh, you can also, um, you know, filter by importance or status or other uh, pieces of information, um, but the tags is really the most useful. Um, so I could just, I'm not going to go ahead and create this, but you can create this and just get notified of the things you're actually interested in. Um, that does rely on someone actually adding the cataloging tag. So if someone submits a bug and they don't add that tag, then you're not going to get notified until someone else comes along and, and adds it. So I keep mentioning bug squashing, um, which <laughs> I will come back to, I promise. But um, the uh, during bug squashing, one of the activities that we work on is making sure tags are correct and adding tags um, that need to be added to things that don't have tags. So I talked a little bit about the anatomy of a um, bug ticket, um, but I want to talk a little bit about the workflow. Oh, uh, also on the handout, if you'll notice, I have an example in there of how to subscribe to a, a particular um, tagged uh, set of bugs. Um, I also have a, kind of the basics of how a bug report starts all the way to the finish um, when it gets released. So basically what happens is someone identifies a problem and now instead of just going right here and reporting it right away you want to do due diligence and make sure that it's actually a bug it's not a you know a configuration issue or just a local issue um, but that it's actually recreatable by someone else um, one way to do this is to um, 
ask, you could ask on one of the listservs to see if anybody else is having this problem. Um, or you could go to one of the community test servers and test on a clean version of um, the software to see how it is working there. There is a link here to the community test servers page. And um, these are servers that volunteers in the community have um, are keeping running that just have you know evergreen, clean evergreen with a default set of data, which is the concerto data set, um, which is mostly music related um, items, and a generic set of patrons. Um, there is also a link there to the concerto logins. So these are fake patrons that are loaded into the concerto data set. So you can test uh, the issue that you're seeing by logging in as one of these patrons um, or staff members, they're staff members too, and uh, testing how it works under one of those logins. Um, those, the settings on those get updated periodically and you know reset back to the master version uh, so you can you know play around with changing like the configuration settings and stuff and uh, test things in different ways and so if you can recreate it of course you want to make sure that it hasn't already been reported um, by doing your searches like we've talked about um, and then if you can't find it and you are sure that it's a bug um, and you can also do this for wish list requests, same process. Um, click report a bug, type in a title. And sometimes it'll it'll give you suggestions to say, okay, you've typed in these words. They kind of look like some of these others. Is, is, has it already been reported? And if not, then you can say, no, I need to report this new bug. Add in all of the inf information that you can. Um, you know, the version of Evergreen that you're using, if you know the uh, database version, et cetera, um, include a very clear description and how to recreate the bug if possible. If you, there's an error message that you're seeing, um, try to either write out the error message or take a screenshot, which you can attach. Um, and then add tags. If it's a wish list request, type the wish list tag. Um, and then, all, uh, you know, then whatever other um, tags are valid. Um, and then you can attach the file here and then submit. And then once it's submitted, as I mentioned earlier, someone else can go in from another organization and confirm it. They can also just add comments or they can mark it as a duplicate if they know that it's been submitted somewhere else um, and you just didn't find it, that's fine. Um, and then once it's and then once they confirm it, they mark it confirmed. Um, so they would change the status to confirmed. And if this is you, if you are looking at someone else's new bug and you can confirm it, then you can mark it confirmed. Um, and then once it's confirmed, another uh, a developer can take a stab at fixing it. So once they do that, the developer creates a patch that they think is going to work. They upload that patch to Git, which I'm not going to get into here, um, but I do. But Git is a, a behemoth. <laughs> Let's say that it's a it's it can take several you know long long uh, sessions to learn about Git. Um, there's some very good um, online classes you can take. I, there's one through Udemy that I particularly liked. Um, that was like ten bucks or something. Uh, so they upload it to Git and then they link it here and then they add a pull request tag to it. So they just edit tags and add pull request. Then someone else tests that and you do have to have access to a test server in order to test a uh, patch. And then it, once they test it, they sign off on it by adding the signed off tag and also by adding a signed off comment. So if you are testing something, if you do have access to a test server, um, either locally or through bug squashing week, then, um, oh, I am running on time. Sorry, I'm just going on and on. I didn't think I was gonna talk this long. Um, <laughs> uh, this is why I have notes for you <laughs> to, to take home. Um, so then they, um, 
uh, oh, I know, I'll show you in the notes. So there is a way to sign off on it through Git if you are a Git user, but if you're not, um, a, you know, you can just add this text into the comment. So you would add the signed off tag and you would uh, add this text with your name and your email address saying that you tested it. You're taking responsibility. You tested it, did due diligence and that and have signed off on it. And then once things are signed off, then the um, one of the core committers, which is a small group of um, of uh, developers that knows the code really well. Um, one of the core committers will take a look at it, you know, double check the code, make sure there's no red flags. It's not, you know, creating some security problem or something. And um, once that once it passes muster, then they change the status to fix released. I mean, I'm sorry, fix committed. And um, they add it to master. So the main core of Evergreen. Then periodically, the um, re the current release manager, which changes with each major version of Evergreen, and the release team and build team will package that up and into one of the either major release or point release or both, and then they will change the status to fixed released. So that's why you know what where that um, bug is at that point. So what can you do now? Um, as a new user for Launchpad, um, you know, of course, the first thing you can do is look through what bugs are already there. You know, use the tags to find the areas that you are particularly interested in. Um, you can add heat. So if you find a circ bug that um, you think is important, um, you can go in and just add heat by saying, yes, it affects me. You can add tags, especially if you see something that doesn't already have a tag. There are things that have no tags and those, those things that have no tags are much more difficult to find. So if you do run across them, uh, add, um, add tags to them as relevant. You can also confirm new bugs. So if you, for example, go to the advanced search and you can just search for the ones that are marked new, for example. And you can take a look if you're showing tags, you can quickly go through and see which if there are any that don't have tags yet. That's a really good activity to do that contributes without having to have a lot of technical expertise or even a um, access to a test, test server at that point. Um, so I want to um, jump over to Bug Squashing Week. There is a link on your handout. Um, let's see. I think I put a link to Bug Squashing Week in here. Yes, there it is. Um, so this has information about Bug Squashing Week. Um, we do Bug Squashing Week and Feedback Fest usually twice per year, um, sometimes three. Um, and they usually come before a major release. So they're pretty much the same, except Bug Squashing Week is more focused on fixing bugs and Feedback Fest is more focused on making sure the next version of the software is you know, put through its paces and tested out so that nothing um, breaks. Um, but, you know, bug squashing does happen in there as well. Um, this is a great time for people to get involved um, for the first time because there are a lot of people um, that are, you know, actively looking at things and, and working together. Um, and what we'll do is we'll have several volunteers put together test servers that have bug, fi bug fixes or the new version applied. And then everyone else can just log into those test servers without having to do the, you know, run a test server themselves or or configure it themselves or anything. So um, um, that's a, a really great way to get involved. And um, I guess I'm running out of time, but I just want to say that feel free to reach out to me. There's a few other um, sites and uh, things 
posted on there. I also want to point out that uh, after I wrote, decided what I was going to talk about, I remembered that Andrea Boons Nyman and Mary Jingaluski um, did a really beautiful presentation on this same t subject a couple of years ago, and their slides are still available. So feel free to look back at that as well. Um, you know, as a addition or refresher, um, they did a presentation. And uh, that's, does anybody have any questions that I missed? Looks like Jason, thank you for helping in the conversation. Yeah, it seems like a lot of the questions were answered in chat. Okay. So thanks for participating in that um, or chatters. Yes. yes, thank you, Jason and Jeremy. Okay, well, um, thanks very much, Taryn, uh, for yet again bestowing wisdom onto uh, <laughs> Launchpad. I know we had to talk about this in the new devs oh. meeting, too, so. Yes, yes, um, Mary, uh, <laughs> yeah, you can add comments to existing bugs, yes. So if you, if the initial, um, if the initial bug report didn't, include all of the different fa factors or if you have you know if you do a different workflow so you're seeing a slightly different problem but it's still related to the same bug or if you just want to confirm this is really important to us you can add any of those comments as well um, and yes anyone can confirm a bug you should just make sure you're not from the same organization that reported the bug that's just poor poor uh, mm. community <laughs> practice <laughs> to do that and feel free i'm going to put my email in uh, chat um, feel free to contact me directly if you have a question i know doing your first um, tag or confirmation or anything can be intimidating uh, so feel free to contact me if you want me to check and make sure you're doing it right or if you want to ask me a question before you do anything, feel free. I'm happy to help. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you, Taryn. All right. So we got a uh, about like a half hour or so of a break before a session start again at 2.30. There's the catalogers organizing locally in track one and stay in track two if you want to go to the report interest group. <laughs>